Okay, we are back. Uh, one of my favorite people. I have fact tonight. I'm lucky. I have two of my favorite people here tonight. There's one of them. I love animals. Oh, always have. And uh, you can always count on Mark Maisie from Boone Shaw's Museum of Discovery to bring some interesting animals and educate us all. If you have not been to Moonshot, you need to go. There's always something new and exciting going on. Make him welcome, everybody. Mark Maisie. Hey, Mark. How you doing, buddy? Good. Well, um, I was, uh, I meant, I don't know if I told Harry or not, but um, I looked at a promotion video. You remember Bob Braun? Oh, yeah. He had, um, from Columbus, um, Jack, Hanna. Jack had on. Yeah. In 1977, I think that was his 15 year anniversary of the Bob Brown Show. Wow. He brought on a baby camel, three goats, and they took over the studio. <laughs> the one goat went out in the audience, jumped over the women, and got in the middle and uh, decided it was time to go to the bathroom. So Bob Brown goes over and they said, What'd you do at the Bob Brown Show? Oh, I sat next to some old goat. Those animals <laughs> tore that studio up, and it was the best, most fun. That's of course, you know the famous, Marco. you know the famous scene with Carol Burnett when the horse was on stage. I'm yeah, sure yeah, everybody's seen yeah, that. Seen so he brought some animals with him, and it's always fun and exciting to see these animals. Which one you want? This one first. Let's do the one in the blue first. The big this key. one. Yeah, the other one first. Okay. Yeah, he said he's sounding anxious, so we'll go ahead and bring him on out. There you go. All right. This is actually. Let me just I'll put this here to get him out. This is our newest guy that we have, our newest animal, um, <coughs> and he's really cool. All right, let's do that. There you go. Okay. So this is a three-banded armadillo, Whoa. and he'll kind of get brave and open up here for us in just a minute. Um, but he's full-grown, and there. So in, in the southern United States, we have nine-banded armadillos. I get much, you know, two or three times the size. This guy's a three-banded armadillo. Some of the things okay. that make them unique, they're South American, and the reason I brought him is because they're, at the museum right now we have an exhibit, our temporary exhibit is called Amazon um, Vicious Fishes and Other Riches, and it's all about the Amazon River and the Amazon Basin. Mm -hmm. um, so this guy would be found in the Amazon in South America. The, but what makes three-banded armadillos different than all the other kinds, there's 20 kinds of armadillos, there's 20 species of armadillo. So these are the only ones, they're smallest, and the only ones I can, can curl up in a complete ball, and I'll see wow. if he'll do it. He doesn't always do it for me now. But if he were scared, which he's not, but if he were scared, he would curl up in a complete tight ball, wow. and uh, you kind of can't see any part of flesh once he does it, and it's for its protection. So he can kind of curl up in a tight ball. He's got that hard shell. Of course, he is a mammal, and you can see kind of he's got a bunch of little hairs poking out there. He is a mammal. He's warm-blooded, just like us. He's an insectivore. You can see those long front claws on the front. Mm -hmm. So he makes his living going around and, and finding termite mounds and big ant hills and just tearing them apart eating as many of the ants and termites out of there as he can. Digging in. And then move, right, and then <laughs> moving on to the next place. Um, but they're, they're really, really cool. This guy, he's about two years old, and he was born at a zoo in, in West Virginia, and he's only been with us for a couple months now. So he's now how do these born. animals get traded off like that? Well, you know, we are, our museum is part of the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and we're, we're, that's pretty unique. We're the only, there's only, there's, I think, there's about 300 institutions that belong to the AZA, but there's only five museums within that group. So it's larger, you know, Cincinnati Zoo, Columbus Zoo, that kind of thing. Um, but within the AZA, we will, we will exchange animals around. Our, you know, our goal, of course, is that we don't, we don't really take animals from the wild anymore for zoo right. exhibits. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we have really healthy animals. So we, we cooperatively, among all AZA institutions, we, we will exchange animals so that we're breeding, you know, matching, making good pairs and breeding and, and having good genetic um, you know, thought behind what we're doing. So we, we will, um, you know, if we decide we want something new for our collection, we'll just kind of put it out there with other zoos and see if anybody has anything available. And sometimes we just wait. You know, we will wait rather than take something from the wild or from a breeder that we're not sure of. So we've actually wanted an armadillo since we opened up our, our new zoo back in 2010, and it's just taken us this long to get one. Um, I've never seen an ugly animal. <laughs> they're, all, they're, all, they're all, well, not a four-legged kind, anyway. <laughs> so that's guys, he's the three-banded armadillo. His name is Sheldon. And he seemed very comfortable with me. He is. He, you know, he was captive bred and a zoo setting, has been with, been with uh, animal caretakers his whole life and does really well. I can just set it right so. on top here with your thing. So my theme for the night was kind of rainforest animals, since we have okay. that Amazon exhibit. If they come out to the museum, that exhibit runs through the 27th of April. And in the exhibit, we've got some animals we've never had before. It, actually, part of the exhibit, but things that can't really travel. Like we have stingrays, and we have a, an aquarium with some 
tetras and discus and just some more unusual oh, okay. types of fish. Um, not a big fan of the snakes? No, I'm not a big fan of snakes, no. <laughs> this guy's a ball <laughs> python. Sure. Yeah. And he's, he's not actually from South America, but he's, he's a very tropical rainforest type of snake, so I thought I'd bring him out. He's full grown, so ball pythons are nice snakes in terms of they don't get real long. Um, they are pretty common in the pet trade. Um, now, why is he so comfortable? Because you handle him all the time. You don't have to worry about getting bitten. Right. He's just very used this to it. This is not a poisonous? I mean, he's, no, he's, yeah, he's non-venomous. You know, snakes are venomous, not poisonous, which is one of those, it's the, we refer to them as poisonous often, but a poisonous animal is an animal that if you ate it, it would make you sick. Now, what's a term I heard? If you see a snake and it's really bright colors, they're the worst of the venomous? Often, yeah, often, because yeah. those bright colors are often warning colors, oh, and, okay. and they usually, um, I have a reason behind him. Okay. You know, we actually at the museum we have a an emerald tree boa, um, so another snake that's exhibited with poison dart frogs who have very bright coloring. And everyone always asks, well, why doesn't the snake eat the frogs? And it's you know the warning colors work. The snake knows that if he eats those, they're they're poisonous. Um, so he's comfortable with you because you handle him all the time, is that right? Right, right, yeah. So he's just really used to it. You know, and he is, being a non-venomous snake, he's a constrictor. He, he does have teeth, so if he bit you, he does have teeth and yeah. it would hurt, but he doesn't have the big fangs of a venomous okay. snake. He's just got lots of little, little teeth. And you don't recommend people have this for a pet? You right? know, I really don't. If, if you know, I, with ball pythons, what I always say is that if, if you're going to have a snake as a pet, this is a good one to have because he's not going to get to be 20 feet long like a Burmese python. That, um, so, but in general, I, I kind of shy away from the exotics for a lot of people, mainly because, you know, I get at the museum, I get probably two calls a month um, on average from people who have a pet something that they don't want anymore, and yeah. it's almost always a reptile. It's usually a turtles, yeah. snakes, or iguanas. And what do you do? You depend on if you, you know, need them or not? You know, 99% of the time we don't take them. We, oh. we, we take them if we have space for them and if we think that they, we have a purpose for them. Um, we, we will take them. There is, there's, in Cincinnati, there's a, a kind of like a humane society, but they only work with reptiles, so we usually refer them to them. Right. Um, but, you know, reptiles can be tricky to care for. You've got to get yeah. their heating and humidity just right and that kind of stuff. They're, they're not quite as easy as, as you might think to well, care for. Well, you can't for. say, come on, you want a bite? Sit up. Right. Sit up, come on. Right. You can't do that with yeah. a snake. And, you know, they're, right. they're often, the pets, that, like this guy who, um, you know, if you have him for a while, after, it's not like a dog or a cat who you, you interact with a lot. After the week or two, and they really just kind of sit there, and you know, people lose interest with them yeah. often. And, and, you know, See, they make great shoes. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's right. I won't even show him that. My, no. <laughs> my, my daughter has two guinea pigs. I'm sure the snake would like that. That's too. right. But they <laughs> don't do much either. They just sit yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You know? I have a cat, and I like my animals to sleep with me, but I don't think I'd want to sleep. <laughs> no hard feelings? <laughs> But, you know, and one other neat thing about bio pythons, and that, you know, this might be hard to see, you see his tongue sticking out, and they do use their tongue to help with a sense of smell. He's kind of picking up odors in the air. But pythons, in general, have a lot of heat receptors, more than most snakes. So if you mm -hmm. look at his upper lip, it's nothing but he's got all these tiny little holes on his upper lip. Mm -hmm. um, and those are actually their, their organs, their heat sensors. So these guys, they rely on, on the sense of heat to find food, because a lot of their food is mammals and birds, yeah. which are warm-blooded, and warmer than he is, he's cold-blooded, so their body temperature will be higher than he is, and he senses that warmth and heads in that direction. So those little, they're called pits, but they're heat-sensing organs. Well, Mr. Stone King, did you want to? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised, though, because I, I have touched snakes before, mm -hmm. and I was amazed that they're a smooth surface, right. almost like satin, yeah. where the appearance would be, you know, Slimy, right? Is what a lot of people interpret. think they're slimy. Yeah, right. you know they're they're um, they they have scales, and they are they're very very dry. And if you think about it, you know, like even in nature shows and things like that, or if you're ever out hiking in the woods and you see a snake on the ground in the wild, they're never dirty because right. snakes are so dry that dirt doesn't really stick to them. We, we have more oils and, and moisture on our hands than than he does. We're more slimy than he is, um, but yeah, they're very very dry. Um, they just don't, they don't Touch secrete him, any kind of thing. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you wanted to talk about uh, Springfield, too. Yeah, you know, we've also, one of our newest things at the museum right now is we've opened up a, a satellite museum in Springfield. Um, it's up the, at the Upper Valley Mall in Springfield, mm -hmm. and it's actually, it, it was an Elder Bierman store, so it was one of the anchor stores in the mall, and we've renovated it into a museum, and it's, it's a lot of fun. It's really cool. Um, it's worth, worth making the trip to check out, especially if you live on that side of town. Okay. Um, it's a smaller version, kind of, of, of the museum. Okay. So we've got just a few animals there right now, but, and the thoughts is that, you know, over the next few years, it's, we're going to keep expanding that area. And, and uh, you know, we, we, are, we have exhibits taking up about half of the space in, the, in, in the, our location now. So over the next couple of years, we'll keep expanding that. Okay. And, 
you know, before long we'll have the whole space filled. But Thank they can you, do Mark. school groups and everything out there. So, all right, Mark's not going anywhere. He's going to stick around with his little uh, uh, unslimy friend. <laughs> <laughs>